Okay. All to order the ninth regular meeting of the Board of Directors of School Administrative District Number 52. Uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Jessica. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, first order of business is to act on the 8th uh, regular board meeting minutes on December 14th. Does anyone have any uh, comments, feedback on these minutes? Seeing none, we will come to that unanimous consent. Uh, I'm going to start off tonight uh, with a report, um, and, and it's a, pertaining just, just very specifically to item 8.2, and you'll see this approval crossed out and acknowledgement written in. And I think um, that's associated with our first readings of policy. I think there's been a few times where we've had first readings and the motion has been to approve those first readings, but there's been substantive feedback. And, the, the notion of approving something that we are still going to revise significantly felt odd, and we've talked about it and, and kind of looked back into um, our uh, policies. Um, and really, if you look at policy BGR, it says really the first reading is, is an acknowledgement of a first reading. And if you look at MSMA's kind of policy workflow, you'll see that they show uh, quite a bit of work being done. Um, you know, in the drafting and the subcommittee process, it gets sent to the board uh, for a first reading to receive feedback, potentially be revised and come back for actual action. So whether that's approving or, or what have you. So um, just here on forward, I'm just explaining that wording change. And I think it makes a little more sense as well um, that first readings will happen. Uh, the motion will be to acknowledge that those first readings have happened, uh, feedback, uh, if, if, if there is such and proposed changes or, or revisions, um, certainly we'll still be um, um, amending those motions to acknowledge the first reading and perhaps make changes or, 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 or what have you as, as the board desires, but it won't be a motion that is to kind of approve the first reading if that, that uh, makes sense. Um, any questions on that? Go right ahead. Are we still voting on amendment, proposed amendments well, during that first reading? So, yes. Um, so it's still a motion to acknowledge, right, which would still need to be voted on. Okay. Um, um, we, if, if we don't vote to acknowledge it, uh, we would still not have had a first reading. Um, you know, so, um, and if there is specific board action that needs to be taken as a result of this first reading and discussion, then we would still need to craft motions, whether it's a, an amendment to the motion to acknowledge, to have those directions, or, or what have you, um, yes, would need to be voted on as a motion and discussed. In, in so, uh, hopefully that, that makes sense. I think you would have liked this, Peter, if you would have been. I'll, agree. I'll explain. More should be. Yes. As I mess it up, you can correct me. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, we'll move on from that uh, to the public comment period. Um, and just to remind folks, um, you know, our board meetings are conducted for the purpose of carrying out the official business of our schools. It is important to note that the board meetings uh, are open to the public. However, they are not public forums. At each full meeting of the board, time is allocated to provide opportunities for citizens and employees to express opinions and concerns related to the matters under consideration by the board. These comments shall be within the guidelines set forth in policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings, and copies of the policy are available on the district website. I just want to highlight a few of the following points from policy BEDH. That is that the chair is responsible for recognizing all speakers. We ask the speakers identify themselves by sharing their name, town of residence. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to express their views. Speakers should direct all comments to the board, specifically the board chair. This is an opportunity for the board to listen to the opinions of the public that relate to school and education matters, but it is not intended to be a conversation or a debate of issues. We know that school related issues can be emotional. But we ask that civility is maintained. We will not permit profanity, gossip, defamatory comments, shouting at one another, or comments that disparage or attack individuals or groups. 
The board is faced with many important issues. So for the sake of efficiency, the board discourages duplication or repetition of comments. The board will not permit complaints or allegations against staff members. We certainly care about these concerns, but they are personnel matters, which the board is not permitted to hear in public. If there are complaints against staff, these will be handled appropriately through our complaint policy, KE. So to reiterate, these are just a highlight of key points. Uh, please refer to policy BEDH for a complete description of the public participation policy. And with that, is there anyone that would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, uh, we shall move on to the next item, which is communications. I'll start um, with a few acknowledgements. The first being an acknowledgement of the book donations to the Leeds Central School through the DonorsChoose.org and funded by Red Maple Audiology and Turner. This is in the amount of $1,064.84. So thank you very much, Red Maple Audiology. There's also an acknowledgement of a donation to the Leeds Central School from Maine Health for the 5210 program in the amount of $1,000, uh, which is a program about healthy eating and active living. Uh, thank you very much, Maine Health. Um, we're also going to acknowledge a donation to Tripp Middle School from Hannaford Health Schools program in the amount of $1,318 for non-perishable purchases for Tiger Takeout Pantry. That sounds like a great program. <clears throat> Thank you very much to Hannaford Helps. Um, there's another acknowledgement, fourth here, uh, of a donation to Green Central School from Keep Driving Foundation, uh, which is part of the Berlin City Auto Group, in the amount of $750 for book purchases. So, Thank you, Berlin City um, and the Key Tribe and Foundation. Uh, with that, uh, do you have any questions? So I would like to report the Winston Chip Gilbert, everyone knows him as Chip, has decided to retire. It uh, became effective on January 1st. He was a transportation specialist. Uh, Pamela, uh, I'm reporting the transfer. Pamela Miller, who is a current bus driver, is transferring into transportation specialist. And just to remind everyone, we have two of those positions. So now one is filled, one remains unfilled. And then two new hires, Alana Hartford as a food service assistant at Leeds, effective January 3rd. And the unicorn in EdTech 3, Madeline Levante, EdTech 3 um, at Turner Primary, effective tomorrow, January 12th. We have a new sub serving Turner Elementary, Tripp Middle, and Turner Primary, and then a new sub serving Green, Turner Elementary, Turner Middle School, and Tripp. Uh, sorry, Turner Primary School and Tripp. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, adjustments to the agenda. You can see a few uh, pieces highlighted in red. Uh, some of those I've already announced. We're going to do the acknowledgments. I spoke in my report about language change of motion 8.2 from approval to acknowledgement. There's also um, some instructional nominations that have been added since this was originally published. All in all, nothing too uh, too, too substantive. Um, anything further, Carrie, that I missed? No. So um, moving on to committee reports. Uh, I believe the Finance Committee did meet tonight. Crystal, do you have the report? Yes, we met this evening. Um, the <clears throat> first thing we discussed was consideration of backdating reclassification for special ed school secretaries. That's going to be coming back to the full board, I believe, at the next meeting. We'll be having a discussion about that. Um, we discussed the athletic training services. Um, with more to come during budget season on that one, as well as transportation specialist. Um, we'll be talking more about that in budget season. Uh, really exciting news. <laughs> we, were, we were granted a rebate from the years 2006 through 2008 for workers' compensation to the tune of $17,000, oh, wow. um, which <laughs> is unanticipated money, so it has to go to our miscellaneous revenue funds. Um, so yeah. <laughs> it will roll over or will roll over into our general fund. Um, we also reviewed October, November financial reports and we reviewed and signed payroll and accounts payroll warrants. I heard 2006, 2008 correctly. Yes, you did. <laughs> so still on. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that's... Can't wait to see what happens. I, yeah. <laughs> we're like, we have to see 
nineties. You can unearth. Honestly, the things that I uncover, I'd rather not. Unearth. <laughs> 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 Honestly, I'm not um, so seven point two, uh, plant transportation and building subcommittee, Mr. Ricker. Yeah, we met um, this morning primarily to finalize, or not finalize, to discussion. Sorry, I did get my mind here. <laughs> the owl was freaking me out. <laughs> Anyways, we met this morning to look at all of the plants, grounds, transportations, basically to take a step back from any major capital improvements and look at the options of bringing in a overall uh, company potentially to look at, to get an overall battle plan on how we want to move forward with any large major capital improvements. Um, so that was primarily the start and the completion of that meeting was all discussion around that. Um, based, it started with the football field and the whole idea of the new turf potential donation and so forth. And we're like, well, we need to take a step back before we jump too much into this until we see what the whole picture looks like throughout the whole district. There's a lot of projects and a turf field is not just a turf field. It's a drainage, it's DEP, it's a whole bunch of things that sometimes we don't think about. So um, so that was a primarily the meeting and we're gonna meet again on right before Valentine's Day. I'm expecting some very high-end chocolates. Um, <laughs> Who are not clear. <laughs> and um, to have more detail on that and that's what our options would be financially to move forward with those type of plans. And then just for the sake, it's an additional meeting. Oh, That's yes, regular it's not, meeting. Right. my apologies, yes. Yeah. We have a meeting, I think, before that. So you're talking about January 25th? And, and then, then we have February 13th. 13th. Correct, thank you. We could have done the 14th, but apparently some people have the five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Peter. Um, curriculum and policy, Jamie. Yeah. Um, Teresa and I found ourselves having a knack for scheduling our agenda meetings um, when Mother Nature did not want to cooperate with us. So we were supposed to meet tonight, as I reported out um, last time, but we had to postpone that. So our next meeting will be January 25th at 5.30 p.m. Um, on today's agenda, um, we have two policies. Both of these policies were recommended by CMP and voted on unanimously. Um, and they were both brought to us because of updates to reflect the amendments to the Maine Human Rights Act for ACAA and then a legislative update for JKAA, so. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, Reporting out on the Tritown Education Association support staff negotiations, Jessica. Yes, we continue to meet. We met uh, this week again, so we had a little break because of some holidays, but we met again. We continue to have really good participation from both sides, um, ESP and negotiation team. Um, so we continue to make good forward progress, I believe. And Tammy continues to feed us delicious food. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm beginning to think you're challenging me with the student uh, reports. Should Gary. be Sydney. And Sydney, are you going to talk a little bit about? Okay, good. Sydney's going to update you. All right. Because, so, with our yes. student representative report, So, since we've come back from break, the main focus for most everyone has been getting ready for midterms that are next week. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was over the next two meetings, I will be introducing two juniors who will also be board representatives okay. for the school. Very good. So there's two of them. Succession. I think one in the next meeting and then one in February. Awesome. All right, thank you. Um, which brings us to um, administrative reports. So uh, up first, uh, Principal Shaw. So I have handouts, so I'm gonna give the handouts first. <clears throat> Uh, these are hot off the press today. These are uh, our five catalogs for June of 2024. Uh, with I have them. So exciting. Waiting anxiously for this. Yes. I'm not going to go through the entire thing. You guys can look at it uh, when you like, but there are uh, some activities that, uh, that uh, 
are similar or the same as we had it in the catalog last year, and there are some new ones as well. Uh, and we're looking at having students begin the sign-up process in the next few weeks. I'm oh, sorry, Carrie wants one. Well, Joe, Joe wants one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll start the sign-up process in the next couple of weeks. We'll put a, uh, a Google form out for students. They will be able to pick um, several. I think last year we did five, and we do our best to get students who one of the top five picks. Last year we were able to do that for uh, virtually every student got one of the top five picks, so uh, it worked out really well. So that is a lot of thanks to uh, the faculty and staff for pulling that together, and, and um, Miranda Mishu for putting the catalog together. So uh, that's that's our Hive catalog. A um, couple of items of interest that I wanted to point out: uh, we we also we picked up a couple of ed techs. I mentioned it in the report that you have. Uh, Mrs. Drysdale has been working with Hey Tutor, where is she? Hey Tutor, that's right, right? Hey Tutor is an outside uh, organization that helps to uh, find uh, ed techs. And uh, we've been able to pick up a couple over the last couple of weeks, which is huge for us. Um, we've been without them for basically the entire year. So uh, they were exceptionally anxious to start with us. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, they, they came right in and were raring to go. Uh, and have fit right in, so it's, that's been good. Um, additionally, uh, we have, you will notice uh, in postings coming up in the next few weeks, a world language teacher that we uh, start, we started to search for uh, at the start of the school year, that didn't pan out, so we stopped the posting because it just made more sense to do that. We'll be reposting that in the next few weeks uh, along with um, and academic, academic support at Tech. Uh, other items of interest, uh, the 10th graders went to the career fair last week down at uh, Central Maine Community College. They uh, again had 40 or 50 options to pick from. They picked uh, their top three or four and every single one of them got their top three choices. Boom, whenever we talk they, and we had uh, conversations with whatever um, career that was, that, and it was, it was small group conversations. They were able to ask questions and get an idea of really get an idea of what the career is. They will also be going, interested 10th graders will be going down uh, and touring the LRTC program on, on February 9th. Um, but in a couple of weeks, uh, next week, next weekend, the 19th and 20th will be uh, the musical, SpongeBob the musical will be happening in the uh, auditorium. Uh, I've been watching the set as it's been getting built and been listening to rehearsals. Uh, they are getting a little anxious based, my understanding is they're getting a little anxious because they've missed some time due to weather and whatnot. So, uh, but they're uh, confident they will be ready to go for next Friday and Saturday. And uh, two other things, uh, as Sydney mentioned, next week is midterm week. Uh, I sent out um, an email to parents today with the midterm calendar with an asterisk next to it that was this is entirely weather dependent. So we'll see how it turns out next week, whether or not that is the actual schedule that we follow. Uh, but that is the one I sent out today. And then last but not least, today was the first day of the letter reading challenge. And if I read the information correctly, this is year nine of the letter reading challenge. Uh, and uh, lots of fabulous prizes for uh, students and, and on their reading bingo sheets and then uh, I think uh, Mrs. Lashman is already making plans for the 10th anniversary reading challenge, which will be uh, next year. So that is my update for you today. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, any questions for Principal Shaw? Okay, thank you. Um, up next is Principal Parker from Green. Uh, good evening. Uh, probably the most exciting piece of news that we have for uh, Green. I'm going to pause on and I'm going to defer to Superintendent Ned because I'm very confident that that is in her report um, this evening. So there, there was some uh, a lot of excitement recently. No, that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. But that, that's kind of like our big headline. And we're, yeah, that's what we call a teaser, right? Um, but uh, another uh, interesting point are the GCS student ambassadors. Um, have begun their work, and this is a very, very enthusiastic group. We figured we were, we'd be meeting bi-weekly. Uh, we've met every week so far, and the kids are really excited. Uh, we were able to take 
um, some school climate survey information, and the kids worked through kind of a data analysis. This is anonymous um, feedback, and kind of figured a game plan on how to address some of the some of the needs and the, the concerns uh, from the student feedback. So we're very excited, and we're, we're the kids are thinking about posters, public service announcements, connections with other classes. So it's it's really neat to to see kind of the organic process sort of um, sort of unfold. Um, and speaking of our school climate survey, we would like to thank uh, the, the families of Green. Uh, this uh, this first iteration of our school climate survey for families. When we opened that up, we did do a full court press on that. Um, we ended up with feedback from 111 families uh, from Green Central School. That is quadruple what we got for feedback in the spring of this past year. So we want to just thank all of our all of our families for giving us that feedback, and results were quite good too. So um, that's that's my brief report. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Doug. All right. All the way from Turner tonight, <laughs> Principal Levesque. All right, so um, we were supposed to have a big holiday happening week right before vacation. Um, and I went out and got all the supplies for it on Friday before, which was really helpful because then we didn't really have school that much. Um, but we did, so I already had these prizes. They were like holiday themed. For our ugly sweater contest, what we, I did instead is I randomly selected like one student from each grade. Um, and one student was like, I didn't even try and I won. <laughs> so that, I don't know, that made my day. <laughs> That's awesome. um, and then also during that week, we're supposed to have our book club go up to the high school to meet with the high school book club um, and read our, or share our holiday themed book, A Nancy Drew Christmas. So we are now doing that at the end of January. So we'll still do it. It was a really long book, and my book club still hasn't finished it, so it kind of worked out well. <laughs> yes. Um, and then on student leadership groups, we also had a lot of interest in that. Um, so we have too many groups. We have uh, three, four grades, three, four group that meets every Wednesday, and then a grades three or five, six group that also meets on Wednesdays during their lunches. And then once a month, we have a group called Student Voice. Um, and that was just all of the students that applied to be on the leadership. And I couldn't say no to anybody. So <laughs> just our way of doing it. Um, and one of the ideas that came out of that was a hot chocolate bar. That would be part of our PBIS program. So students who turned in uh, three or more Wildcat Pride cards were able to get a hot chocolate. Um, I was picturing we were going to do this at lunch. I thought it was going to be so laid back. I would take you know, the three cards and then each kid would just get what they wanted. It was not like that. And um, I, at first I was like, we'll do it every week. <laughs> now I said, we will do it like maybe week one other time. <laughs> that was exciting at least. <laughs> Thank you much. Any, any questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Moving on, the assistant superintendent report, uh, Gillis. Okay, so I wanted to provide a few updates from my most recent uh, presentation on our gifted and talented program. So I did say that 5% of students get identified and then I realized that we probably have more identified than we're supposed to. However, I stand corrected. 5% of students for academic services and 5% for visual and performing arts. So crisis averted, we are well within what we need to uh, be, the regulations. And also this week, the Academic Selection Committee met and we reviewed 27 referrals that were teacher referrals, parent referrals, and student referrals. So that was very exciting. And that's what I have for an update. Very good. Any questions here? Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our superintendents. <clears throat> so our last meeting was December 14th, and a lot has happened since then <laughs> that has impacted school, just so we're all clear. So I'm just going to go over a couple of highlights. One, we were supposed to award the Patience Norman Prize before Christmas, but we had to postpone that. So 
we did come over to green and thank you anthony for coming uh, and to tammy and Bree and anthony for serving on that committee and providing the feedback for for us and the prize was awarded to tammy anderson who is a sixth grade teacher here, has been teaching in this district since 1989 uh, and is a rock star. So um, as Doug said, she she got weepy. We really surprised her. She got weepy and he's like, what? He's like, I've never, never seen happens. her get weepy. She's not really, I mean, I've only met her a couple of times, but I've been around and she's not, doesn't strike me as a weepy person. So. It was uh, it was really exciting, and um, she was she was really proud to share it with her students and her class. So it was it was a fun it was a fun moment. Was she okay to receive it on pajama day in her pajamas? That was that was the uh, five thousand yes. dollars in your pajamas. It was, <laughs> it was pajama day at Green, so that was yeah. sort of like great. I'm wearing my pajamas. Yes. thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's that's the exciting thing. So I want to just sort of go over. We we've had some weather events that have had some pretty significant impacts on the school. So I just want to talk about where we are with our snow days and sort of um, what we did on the, our end in terms of um, reacting to December 18th. So December 18th was a big deal. It was uh, a significant storm that um, caused a lot of damage. It was pretty much lost a week of school, and so. I, um, with Gabby, I brought the operations team together after Christmas to debrief everything that had happened because we, we had some pretty significant things occur that made the early dismissal on the 18th very challenging. We were, we were able to do it. We, we did a lot of like, you know, MacGyvering. I keep using that phrase. I don't have a better one. Like just figuring out systems to make it work. Uh, elementary principals were outstanding in terms of helping us to make sure kids were home safely but we lost our communications um, within our buildings. We lost our phones. We lost the radios between the buses. Uh, it was exceptionally challenging on top of power, water, uh, all of that. So um, Dave Coburn, Dave Roberts, Jim Sequera, we, uh, and Gabby and I, and Wally, and we invited Tyler Ham to join us for his perspective as well. We sort of debriefed all this. Tons of notes, tons of action items, but a couple things I just wanted to highlight that we're, we're already sort of working on. Some of these solutions are longer term, like do, do we need to look at sort of larger generator situations to, to resolve power? Um, prior to this, we really lost power in green twice last year where we sort of were like, are we going to have to send just green home? Everybody else is fine. We we're able to resolve those. This situation was more significant because it was more schools, more kids. So um, Wally has worked to make sure we have battery backup on all of our district phones. The flaw with that is those batteries, they last an hour, maybe two. So we need that longer, but we didn't have them set up in every school. So, so that has been resolved. Um, we are re-examining the extra funds. Uh, I think it was provided to you in a report. We have extra funds in food service that we had to make a plan to spend. So we made a plan to spend that largely involved furniture and equipment. Um, after this happened, I went back to what the allowable expenses were and the word generator shows up in the list. So we're now stepping back and reevaluating the plan for spending that additional money to look at what we can do. We can't purchase a generator for an entire school out of these funds, but to provide um, resiliency and backup to the kitchen, it would include water, which would significantly mitigate like the emergency of having to send everyone home if we have water. So we're working on that um, to see what that, um, what that might be able to do. Um, Teresa, Gabby, and I are now on the, the um, software that we use for transportation so that we could have seen where buses were. We would have known where they were. We didn't know that at that time. We weren't part on the software system. We are now, so we can go in and see where buses are, which would have helped us with communication, answering questions. Um, we also have all the cell phone numbers of all the transportation drivers. At one point, I was talking with a superintendent for RSU 10, trying to locate one of our van drivers for a kiddo that they had. And so it, in addition to all the buses, the vans also report that. And then um, bus right, so that, that computer program is bus right. 
Jim is going to be working bus right. The company representatives of the company are going to be coming towards the end of January to do a bunch of updates. And at that point, we'll be ready to pilot allowing parents access to that system to be able to see where their child's bus is using the app, which on that day would have made a big difference for families who would have been able to have that information. So we've got, um, he's going to get that set up. We'll, we'll pilot it, see what that looks like and be ready to roll that out. So I think, those are some immediate things. We got a long list of other things. Dave Coburn's got a lot of work to do with his crew um, and coordinating with principals to make sure that um, emergency lighting is working and those kinds of things. And there's larger issues that you know may have budgetary impact, but may also be long-term planning projects. But we've made some progress on some of those immediate things that came out of this. So in terms of our calendar, with the two days we had no school in October, we have actually only used four storm days because we don't have to make up those two days in October, they were waived. So our calendar has five storm days in it. And after that fifth day, we go to remote learning. So with that fifth day in our future, um, when we came back from vacation, sort of the first thing that the principals and I and Teresa talked about was getting the real remote learning plans in. So. I'll be sending out a family newsletter tomorrow with some with calendar updates and sort of remote learning is coming. And then the principals are going to be working with on communication after that for individual schools, teachers communicating with their families about what that plan will look like. So as opposed to last year, which was a scramble, if you recall, you approved remote days in March and we ended up using one and it was a scramble. This time we have more time to sort of plan ahead. Um, and be ready for that. So those are all the things that happened since we've been back from Christmas. Okay. Very good. Very good. Any questions for Carrie on that? Okay. Thank you. Um, so our consent agenda, and again, just to remind folks, if you would like to pull any of these items, um, um, it's simple as as as. Um, making us aware of that after I've, I've read through. So our consent agenda tonight, uh, these are items to be acted upon collectively, unless the board member asks that a specific item be acted upon individually. We have the review and adoption of superintendent recommended job descriptions, 811, 812, 813, 814. I believe Carrie outlined these in her report. So I did not actually say anything about no, them. She did not, but we have. The Dean of Students uh, from Levitt Area High School, job description, school nurse, uh, pre-K through six, school nurse, seven through 12, and a lead nurse. Um, item 8.2 is consideration and acknowledgement of curriculum and policy committee recommended first reading and acknowledgement of revised policies. Uh, there are two, eight to one is ACA harassment and sexual harassment of students and regulations ACAAR, student discrimination harassment, and Title IX, sexual harassment complaint procedures. That's at 8.22, which is JKAA, the use of physical restraint and seclusion and regulations, JKAAR, procedures on physical restraint and seclusion. So as there... Um, if you want me to provide any information, I totally forgot yeah, about um, this. Sorry. It's, it's all right. Um, is there any of these items that folks would like to pull? Yes. 8.2.1. 8.2.1. So we will bring that out and insert that in as item, we're going to call it 10.2A. <laughs> It'll be 8.2.1. So, To reiterate, that is um, the consideration and acknowledgement of curriculum policy recommended for first reading and acknowledgement of revised policies. That is ACAA harassment and sexual harassment of students and regulations, ACAAR student discrimination harassment and Title IX sexual harassment complaint procedures. We're going to pull that out. Otherwise, uh, the consent agenda uh, would stand. All those in favor of the consent agenda? Well, we have a motion to approve. Yeah, go ahead, Anthony. Does, does his request need a second? No, it's not pulled um, at will. So um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda after pulling item 8.2.1. Kyle, motion 
seconded by Bree. All those in favor of the consent agenda is unanimous. Um, yes, I just wanted to know. So you're pulling 8.2.1. Yes. And you will take it up. We're going to take it up right after 10.2, um, uh, in between 10.2 and 10.3. So, so I call it 10.2A. Do you do you think we could do it after two ten point one because ten point two is executive session? Uh, not in real time. No, I think you're. So these is mine are, old. Is mine wrong? Yeah. Well, you should have revised when I gave you. So okay. under the business, Sorry. there's instructional nominations. There were three of them to be taken up separately. Correct. Could I ask then? I think what Carrie was thinking is, can it be taken up either before or after the special ed director presentation? Which is ten point one. Ten point two is the, the special ed director. Why do I not have an update on? Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe. All right. So hold on. We are going to go right after. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Mr. Isdale's presentation, but before our executive sessions. Sorry. Do either one of us. Yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah I, you okay. gave me. I don't know. What happened. Sorry about that. Okay. It's all right. It's all right. Everyone, we shall move on to um, item 10.1, which is the instructional nominations um, to be acted upon collectively after nominations have been read by the superintendent. So, Carrie, yeah. any nominations? <coughs> One second. Sure. Okay. Okay, so the first nomination is a teacher, kindergarten teacher at Turner Primary School, uh, Chelsea Fournier. She was uh, an ed tech in the library position at Turner Elementary School. And this is the position that um, Lindsay Holst was in before she transitioned to Dean of Students. So Chelsea um, was an awesome ed tech three working in the library and has been subbing in this position in the um, kindergarten class since we started in the new year, has experience planning whole class lessons, integrating science and social studies, um, and is fitting in very well so far in that transition. So knows the kids, knows, um, knows the things that need to happen. The second is, and that is a one year position, so we will open this up in the spring. Uh, the second position is a nurse at Turner Elementary School. Uh, the Turner Elementary, the nurse that was there resigned, I think her last day is Friday. Um, so Chelsea Davies is a nurse. She's coming out of, um, currently working in, she's worked at Central Maine. Orthopedics. Orthopedics, right, yes. Yeah, um, has a wide range of, of experience but hasn't been a school nurse before. So this is gonna be a good transition, but she's got kids in the system and is looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. This is not a one-year position, primarily because a nurse is, nurses typically are moving out of the, the nursing field into the school system. So um, the search tends to be the way it would be regardless of the time of year. So this one would be a permanent position. And then at Leeds Elementary School, we have, where's that paper? Don't have it. Um, Charlotte Swanson, do you guys have it? Okay, so it didn't get into my packet. Charlotte Swanson, yeah. who is coming to us as from a special ed position at Lisbon Community School, um, has, thank you, has a ton of experience um, in behavior, areas of behavior management, um, has a master's degree in, in, those, uh, in that area, and um, Shannon knows her from her previous work, mm -hmm. and was very excited when she reached out to say that she was interested in coming. I think Kyle, you're somebody who likes to say good people bring good people, and I do believe that we are starting to experience that. So she will be transitioning, um, and she is pending certification as well as the nurse pending certification. <clears throat> yes. I'm just looking for clarification. <laughs> when it says I always get confused by the one year thing because of the calendar year versus school, school year. year. So this is a school year position. So in the spring, you will be opening it up yeah. for a position in the fall. Correct. 
Okay, so this will be to finish the school year gotcha. in the open position, and then it will be posted in the spring to begin in the August. Okay. And these people will be welcome to apply. Right. Yeah. Great. So, before further discussion here, let's get a motion on the floor um, to uh, collectively act and approve these nominations that were just read by the superintendent. Yeah. Or something. Sure. <laughs> Does it matter that? Charlotte Swenson's has not been signed by the superintendent. So um, let's get the motion on the floor okay. and then we can continue the discussion around it before we take the vote. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Crystal. All right, now we can open discussion and I think we just heard that. Uh, Carrie. So we were finishing the paperwork today on Charlotte and I spent the afternoon at a conference in Portland and I think that's why it's not signed. So okay. it will be signed when I'm back in the office tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Pending certification and signature. <laughs> yeah, nothing's happening without a signature. Yeah. Um, any other points of discussion on this? Okay. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Moving on, item 10.2. Um, our presentation from the special education director, Ms. Drysdale. So I, I do have a PowerPoint presentation and I am going to okay. um, <laughs> So good evening. Um, my name is Rebecca Drysdale. I'm the director of special education here in the district. Um, my presentation this evening uh, is going to review special education data, but that is something that um, I think we make a lot of decisions around in our department, along with some of the challenges that are associated with that data, and then solutions that we're working on as a district to address those challenges. All right, so this is a graph that I have shared with the board before. Um, these are our historical representation of students over the last seven years um, in ages 5 to 20 years old that receive special education services. As you can see in the last three years, our student numbers have increased to about 98 students and they continue to grow. We do have projected numbers up there for um, 2024 and 2025. As of this school year, um, we are also uh, obligated to service students up to, not until they're 20 at this point, but now up until their 22nd birthday, um, being able to program for them. For that population of students, it's not a lot in our community, it's not a large population of students, but again, our obligation um, is extending. And then we're also likely, we're finding out and getting information from the state that we're also likely to um, take responsibility for three to four year olds in the next year or so. So when we look at the data here, it's our five to 20 year olds, but within the next year or so, we're going to be looking at potentially three to 22 year olds. So we're expanding um, our obligations to about five years. Right. So a question that we had at uh, one of the last board meetings when I had brought up work data in my report was how are students entering special education and what does that look like in terms of our student numbers? So here I have numbers for over the last several years, being, students being referred to special education, students coming to us, we have the acronym there, CDS, but that's our child developmental services, and so those are the three to five year olds. Um, that are coming to us. And in this um, line, kind of the middle green line, represents our four year olds coming to kindergarten to the following year. This doesn't represent what we might be looking at for three to four year olds next year as well. And then we have students who move into our district who are already receiving um, special education services. And that's that last dark green line, which varies um, from year to year. 
So you can see that um, what has increased is our numbers coming to us from CDS um, along with their needs, even though this looks like it is more students, but then also these students are requiring more services. So those services where they might be coming to us as four to five year olds that have academic and behavioral instructional needs. They also might need speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. So those are all services that special education provides. And then our referrals are students being referred to special education because through either their classroom teachers, their parents, or someone outside of school that has great knowledge of the child. And so these students would be students that are uh, suspected of having a disability that adversely impacts their academic performance and that they require specialized instruction in order to make progress in their general education curriculum. All right, the next slide I have right here is looking at the location of special education services. So students with IEPs, or individual education plans, receive either services in reading, writing, math, social skills, and or executive functioning skills. So any of, so this is a chart here, pie chart, which shows you where those services are being delivered. So for the small little piece of the pie, in kind of orangish yellow there, we have 4.4% of our students that are identified at the end of that five to 20 year old are receiving all of their special education services in the general education setting. Students in the lighter green area, special ed and regular ed, are receiving their services in those in both of those settings. So a tip, what might happen, and what I've experienced as a special ed teacher, and <laughs> is that I might have my student um, that's identified with an IEP attend writing instruction provided by their general education teacher uh, within the classroom, and then I might move, go with them to a special education classroom where I will either reteach them, I will teach them a different curriculum, or and we'll do some guided practice together. So that's kind of the combination of both. And then the dark green area, where we have 64.3% of our students, that is where they are being removed from the general education classroom. And they are receiving the, they are reading, writing, math, right? Social or executive functioning skills instruction outside of the classroom. So I bring this to your attention uh, because I know um, we are examining uh, where we're providing our services. Um, according to the special education law under IDEA, uh, students with disabilities have a legal right to receive their special education services with their non-disabled peers, which means within the general education classroom. Um, and as you can see from this graph, that is something that I think we're falling short on as a district and something that we need to start examining to be able to um, support, support our students. In the graduate work that I've been doing, I've came across a study um, of 11,000 students in the United States who had received instruction uh, in the general education classroom and received their specially designed instruction in the classroom. They, after a period of time, they demonstrated higher achievement. Uh, they demonstrated increased attendance, which I know that's a graph that we've been talking about all most of the school year. They have also um, shown to really be able to be closer to closing the gap so that they may not leave special education moving forward later in their school career. So those are all pieces that we would hope for all students to be able to be able to perform along with their general education peers um, to the closest extent possible. They were compared to students who were segregated because of their disabilities um, and that data was brought forth in terms of that group of students that was segregated did not have the same um, educational outcomes as the students that included. Go over to that next piece here. 
So this is a graph that I have shared as well um, before in terms of we have more students. This is our child count um, for students with identified disabilities. We have more students associated with disabilities um, that are related to behavioral needs. And so an example of this, if I was to take an example of um, a student that we might may have symptoms of an emotional disturbance, um, if a student has an emotional disturbance, they have a, a clinical uh, mental disorder, mental health disorder. Um, if this was someone like a student that we may have that might have depression, um, one of the areas that we would be looking at would be if they could build and maintain satisfactory relationships. But if they're at the depressed at a clinical level, they may not be able to communi communicate regularly to be able to build or sustain those relationships. Uh, they may have inappropriate behaviors and feelings under normal circumstances. They may, let's just say, for instance, maybe in a math class, if math um, they were feeling was aversive to them, then they might pull their head hood over their head, they might put their head on the desk, um, and when the general education teacher or um, supports that support the student try to interact with that student, again, they, they demonstrate behaviors that, that we wouldn't expect. Um, a student to be able to demonstrate, and so they would be making progress. Another area um, what, that we would look at would be if they had a tendency to develop physical um, symptoms or fears um, related to personal or school problems. So if they're seeing math as aversive, they may ask to go to the bathroom, they may ask to go to the nurse, they may ask to go home. Um, we're looking at uh, significant attendance issues. So those are students that we're working on to be able to maintain themselves in the classroom, um, but they are, they're developing symptoms. Um, so that we have to um, certainly address those to be able to support them. So what are we doing uh, to address these challenges as a district? And I've just kind of broken them down a little bit here, looking at the increased numbers of students and their ages. Um, a, a majority of our students being educated away from their general education peers. And then we have an increased number of students with behavioral needs. So some of these solutions that we're working on as a district kind of intertwine and they, they um, these solutions address multiple areas that we're working on. So for students we'll to be able to, with our increased numbers and our service delivery, uh, we are working on as a district, our um, creating our identifying our key standards, our critical standards, uh, working with entering those into our Atlas program. Um, so we have that district wide. We're also developing curriculums for students uh, to be able to address all of their needs in the general education classroom. Uh, at the elementary level, we are working on our positive behavior intervention and supports uh, for K-6 to, to address students' learning needs, how, how to behave in school, and how to behave as learners. We have, um, over the last couple of years, we've been working on provide, pre, um, purchasing <laughs> and then providing training for our um, specialized interventions and training for reading, writing, and math. Again, our social skills and our executive functioning skills. Uh, so we have those research-based materials for teachers. We're also examining our administrative structures and we're looking at the increased age span. We're looking at more students um, in, our, in our classrooms and how to best support them, um, which may have budget implications coming forward in this budget season. And then we're also, very exciting, we are also, I really value outside set of eyes, being able to give us um, some information and feedback on how we can improve to be able to support our students. So we, um, I've reached out, we're gonna be partnering with the University of Farmington to complete a special education audit with um, a group of our staff. Um, and if anybody would like to join, <laughs> they can certainly do that. We're gonna be examining um, our special education structures and really through the lens of inequities. Um, so we're really gonna be analyzing data lots of copious data that we're going to be gathering um, and then we're going to be looking at what we're doing really well in and then what are some areas that we want to improve um, to be able to improve our close practices and really our collaborative 
uh, relationships that we have within the district between special ed and regular education. Right, then we have solutions uh, for child development services and those potential changes coming our way. So again, we're going to part of our examination of our administrative structures is looking at who uh, who's going to be overseeing right? the work that we need to be doing, who is going to be um, working with case managers closely to make sure that we are supporting our students and our families. Um, we're going to be looking at our case managers. Um, what does that mean for three to four year olds? What does that mean in terms of potential partnerships with child development services um, if they continue to exist in, in some of the um, resources that they have. And then also looking at the services that we provide and our staffing. So looking at what, what our students need for three or four year olds that are, have academic behavioral instruction, speech, OT, and PT. Our next one is around extended eligibility. Uh, so for when we think about um, most often these would be students in our functional support program at the high school. Um, so for our 19 to 2, 22 year olds and really trying to identify what do they at that age, what do they need for special education services um, in order to be part of their community. Um, and it's not the school community, it is really the community, Green, Leeds, and Turner. What do they need um, to be able to support their employment and their volunteer opportunities? Something that we have done a couple of years ago um, is we have started our community-based job program within the within, uh, functional support program where our 9th through 12th graders are doing have employment opportunities in volunteer partnerships, but right now what they're doing is they're really start with training for those. And so typically ninth graders, when they come into the program, they'll be doing jobs um, around the school of Levitt. <clears throat> and then when we're looking at the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, we're developing our community partnerships and they are going out during the school day and they are doing training on the job with support, along with having curriculum that supports that within the classroom as well. So what it's all, when you enter that ninth grade, you're slowly getting them ready, um, ready to kind of jump off the cliff um, at mm -hmm. high school and enter into adulthood. So we're, we're looking at that and seeing how we can um, have that program be a little bit more robust. Then we're also developing, we're working on developing partnerships uh, with local adult services. So students, not only if they, they're not going to employment or volunteer uh, jobs that they'll be doing, um, then they could be working, they could be doing like an adult day um, service that they're part of, or it could be adult living services that they also provide. And then we're also working on building our relationships with adult case managers so that in that 9th, 10th, 11th, or 12th grade year, we're really working as a team. Um, to be able to support to support our students because that not all of them might need um, to stay until our 22nd birthday because we really have done a really good job getting them ready for adulthood. All right. And our last one, the support for behavior solutions, there's a lot of the work we're doing now, um, what we're doing in PBIS, but the work that I had talked about are our restorative practices that the middle school and high school are looking into. Um, we are looking at our curriculum development to be able to reach all students. Uh, we're currently providing clinical counseling with our social workers and our school psychologists. And again, we're going to be looking at our administrative structures on how best to support um, students with behavioral needs. And then also looking at having a board certified potential behavior analyst as a, a budget implication so we would have expertise ready and available to students in programs and students outside of programs um, and students prior to referral for special education. So that if a principal um, was working closely with a student that was having challenging needs on one afternoon, that person could either be there um, to be able to support them, or they could certainly be there the next day. Um, currently, we've been contracting, um, and we have great contracted providers, but we have to fit into their schedule um, to be able to service our students. So there may be delay 
um, in the support that we're able to give them. Although they're fabulous, but it, it's sometimes early. So those are kind of wrapped up uh, where we are in terms of some of the challenges we're facing based on the data and some of the solutions um, that we're working on. Very helpful, but also thank you for the work that you and your you know, staff does because it is very important. Um, so you're saying that we're going to expand up to four years, two on one end and two on the other, and um, that's mandated. <laughs> state correct. If the up to 22 year olds absolutely is, um, and so and typically that's 19. Typically our students graduate at age 19 or eight, not not 19, 17, 18 in that year. Um, so those would be several extra years that they they would potentially be with us. And then the, we are learning um, as as a district of, of administrators what. Um, it may look like for three to four year olds. I know we've been hearing it for several years. I remember coming to the board <laughs> um, and talking about um, being responsible for three to four year olds. But it, every time we're like, okay, it's, we're getting a little closer, we're getting a little closer. And I don't know how to say it in serious, all seriousness, it, it's probably where the closest we've ever been to at this point being responsible. So, um, where the services are delivered, the actual environment. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you indicated that about 64% are taking place in the special ed classroom. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I'm just wondering um, when a child does better in that environment or you've determined that that's where they need to be, uh, what oftentimes are their needs? What is the area that you're attending to? Is it academics? Is it, is it um, behavioral? Um, I, well, I think in order for us to, to move kind of the pendulum um, and looking at that, there, there are some large, large shifts district-wide that I have talked about that, we, that need to be put into place to be able to do that. Um, but typically, if I was looking at a student that might not right now be in their classroom, they would be in, a, in another environment where they would get a different curriculum. So it wouldn't necessarily be everything math, it would be or from the delta math that's happening across the district, it would be to get either what we would call number worlds or another specialized curriculum. It would necessarily mean that they have behaviors um, within the classroom, uh, but there are also students that, that might have behaviors to be able to impact that. And I, when we look at that, I, you know, I am, I am somebody who's, I am realistic. Um, and, but at the same time, I do know we, we need to be doing something as our moral obligation to our students, not only to follow the law, um, but really it's a more moral and ethical imperative that, that they, they do, they are, they do belong. Because they are general education students, so that belonging mm -hmm. piece is okay. Um, also, as far as outside agencies, behavioral health professionals, how, do you have any idea of how many of our children in MSAD 52 actually get outside behavioral health support? I know that it's a huge field. I know many people that work in it, and I'm just wondering how that impacts our district, or if it does. I know we have a, a program break in, in house right here, but I'm talking about they go to school and then they receive a service after school. Do we know anything <coughs> in regards to how that works or if it? I don't, well, I don't have the number of students, but if you, are you talking about students that may have, like from an agency Woodford's? Yeah. So when they go home, Pathways. they might have a behavioral health professional that yeah. is helping them when they're in the home. Yes. We, we, we do have students um, that have that across the district, but I, I don't know the exact number. But we but the two don't combine, right? What well, happens? well, it's interesting that you say that because we do have a, we have a partnership with Woodford's um, through the Manchester office. <clears throat> and so we they, they do come into school. We have um, school supports, VHPs, um, and that's over seen by their behavior analyst 
um, those BHPs are, but they really much like they are our work employees during the day. Like we take care of them during the day and, and they're ours. Um, and then we do have a few of those individuals, very few, that will go to the home with the student afterwards and be able to support them in the home. Um, it, it is kind of a thing of beauty when you have the Woodford's group working with them at CD52, and we're able to support them during the school day, and they're also able to support them at home, and that, that makes a huge difference for the kiddos. We do have a number of social workers, though, through Spurlink that provide services right. and do home visits, and I think every school's got one at least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions, if I can. One is you you referred to a study that you uh, came across um, mm -hmm. about mainstreaming and the success. Did the study go into what kind of manpower was required for that? Was 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 there a different kind of uh, manpower in the special ed classroom as opposed to the mainstream classroom? It, it did not. It did not. When I was looking at the study, it, it talked more about what um, right definitions in the beginning and what it all means, and then what the result, you know, what what they used um, mathematically, and then what the results were. Um, however, I, I'm hoping through the audit process and our work with UMF that we'll be able to have some of those conversations of, of what it would look like. Because I think it has to be realistic for our students, it has to be realistic for our budget. Um, and then also, I, I want like I want an outside eyes to look at, really, are we using, could we use our ed techs differently? Could we use our teachers differently? We've had such a shortage for so long, um, other than the first in some ed techs that we've been able to, we've been able to have, but um, being able to look at that too, um, to be able to, to support that. I know there's a big there are big pushes out there for co-teaching, lots out there for training uh, for teachers as well. Thank you. And the, my second question, I don't know, might be better directed toward Carrie. Um, if the state is mandating that we expand these services, will the state be expanding what they give us for these services? I, well, this afternoon is why I was not in the office and did not sign the paper because part of the conversation that actually started Friday, we did a full Zoom with the Department of Ed. All, all um, superintendents, business managers are invited to start to hear some of the brainstorming that's happening around CDS and what the funding model will look like. This afternoon, I, the meeting I went to provided a little bit more detail of what that funding would look like. So yes, it would involve more funding, but it's still pretty infant, like the stages of it are pretty infant. But I think they've been talking about CDS for a long time. We and one other state are the only states in the country that operate a model for this grade level, of, this age level of students outside of the public school system. So, and the, and the federal government is coming to do a statewide audit in March. So everyone is sort of agreeing that we are being pushed to actually make this decision now. So it will be, um, we will, within the next three years, be taking on some responsibility and there will be some finances for that. What exactly that's gonna look like, I don't know. But yes, there will be money with it. And I'm sorry, do you happen to know if that, that would primarily come through the, the executive branch in proposing budgets? If the legislature determines the plan for CDS, because CDS is a quasi-governmental agency, so it's not fully part of the executive branch. It's got it's it's got a foot in both worlds. Um, the legislature will approve a plan of how those services will be delivered. Then the funding will come next. Part of that plan would be what the funding would look like. Some of it would come through the funding formula, but some of it would be separate from the funding funding formula. Still part of you know the the annual budget, but it would be in it would have a, a piece in both worlds is what I learned today. Thank Again, you. very preliminary, nothing in writing. What is CDS? Child Development Services. Oh, okay. Yeah, what they provide for children before they get to public schools. Okay. Any further questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's move on uh, to 10.2 uh, and a half. <laughs>
um, and uh, which is the consideration and acknowledgement of curriculum policy committee recommended first reading and acceptance acknowledgement of revised policies ACAA harassment and sexual harassment of students and regulations ACAA R student discrimination harassment and Title IX sexual harassment complaint procedures. Is there a motion to acknowledge that? So, Mr. Ricker, second. Yeah. Kyle, and discussion. Um, I don't know uh, if it makes sense. Probably first to start, uh, maybe by a um, quick statement from our policy committee. This came from them unanimously, but um, any um, sure. ability to kind of summarize uh, <laughs> what, 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 what has happened? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we had a great discussion about this in um, uh, committee. Uh, if you notice up on page 14, the very last page, the reason why this came to us to be updated, because um, it was just revised in 2022, um, was because the Maine Human Rights Act was amended. So um, it just was a legal reference. However, in our discussion, um, we did uh, make a few changes. Um, mostly references and then further defining it for clarification on page three, um, really just kind of simple edits. And then the big thing that we added and I wanted to, um, you know, really make sure to make this point is on page six, um, 3A3, uh, so the sample policy, the previous policy, and most of the policies from any of the surrounding districts, um, it actually doesn't make any mention about parental notifications. And um, we know that, you know, the board has had a lot of discussion about that recently. And um, we just wanted the board to know that we had, you know, listened. And so we did on page six add in that, um, parental or legal guardians will be notified when appropriate. And um, so that was one of the additions. Um, and I just, I think that's really it. The rest was kind of semantics and definitions. I don't know if Anthony or Bree has anything else they want to add that we had edited on this. I think we took out a small bit of wording that, that was recommended that was not in the law. Um, and we just thought for clarity's sake, it would be better to just not have that. Yep. Um, and I believe that, that the reason that it says um, parents and legal guardians would be notified when appropriate is because there, there are some legal situations where uh, perhaps one of the people involved might be a parent. And so it, there, there are some situations where it really would not be and the most succinct way to kind of state that the policy was we thought this way, but um, I'll, I'll hear arguments otherwise perhaps. <laughs> All right, so I guess I'll, Peter, you had wanted to. I, I, just, I have a couple of thoughts. Yep, go right ahead. Um, I do want to thank for the addition of that to at least acknowledge to a point that um, we should try to communicate with the parents as much as we can. I'd also like to say that I'm sure whenever possible, for the moment, it is being done, but I'm looking for, you know, we're planning for the future. Who knows who's going to do what in the future? So we have to account for that. Um, one of the first things that popped to my mind, it is that's added there to inform parents and guardians um, to discuss support measures and so forth. But there really still is nothing in there, even with the, if appropriate, added to it, to, uh, to inform parents or guardians when an action takes place, which I realize would lead to support measures in the end anyways. But I look at this that it's accounts, this policy, if I'm not mistaken, accounts for everybody in the school district. All minors from say, well, I guess from pre-K up to they leave us seniors um, as well as staff, but I'm more worried about the minors. So we could be talking about a third or fourth grader who has, you know, let's go on the less the bullying aspect, you know, along those lines. And 
at how I read this, there is nothing in there. That, so if, if somebody says my child is being bullied, unless they wish, unless my child who's in third grade wants mommy and daddy to be told they're being bullied, they're not to be told. And to me, that's necessarily wrong. And that's kind of how I read it and if I'm reading it wrong. And, and so I guess I'm wondering, these words account for all age groups and for kids who really have no, you know, they're just beginning to even comprehend, you know, subject matter. So, so that's just one of the things, you know, quite honestly, if my child is being bullied and God forbid, harassed sexually or however, um, I just, I hardly find it amazing that it's not our responsibility to pass it on. I understand there's some legal aspects there that we have to jump through. Um, so with that being said, I couldn't, there's no way unless the laws change that I can make the changes that I would like to make. <laughs> so one of the couple things I'd like to add in addition is a statement along the lines that, and, and again, by saying this, I'm not thinking it's not happening but to make sure it isn't overlooked. A statement along the lines that says the AAO officer, if that's the correct terminology, I believe, is, in, is I hate to use the word force, but force, to ask the minor, can I, can I communicate with your parents? Because in there is nowhere that says that that is a step that has to take place, unless it's addressed somewhere else. You know, it would be, I think it'd be behoove us to just remind the minor, say, hey, can I communicate with mommy and daddy about this? Um, and that, of course, would depend upon that officer making the determination that it's safe to communicate with mommy and daddy about this. Uh, then part of me, especially with the younger grades, so that's one statement I would like to add. I'm not going to suggest exact wording or where or anything because I think that is kind of wrong for me to do sitting outside of the committee putting this policy together without trying to decide where exactly to put it in. Um, with that being said, though, I do feel that the younger, I'm just, I'm still flabbergasted that my third or fourth grade can be being bullied and I cannot be told about it. That just that just that just kills me the thought of it. Unless there's another bullying process, but it's not addressed here, and that's yeah, bullying's labeled here. It's, so unless it's double checked somewhere. It's referenced at the end. It's a okay. separate policy. J I C K is a bullying policy. Okay. So this is just um, very specific to sexual harassment, and if you look on page two, um, it actually gives like a definition of what sexual harassment involves. So okay. it gives like quid pro quo. Yeah, no, I, I, I saw that, but you know, I also read through here bullying and all aspects were covered under this policy. So that's clarified in another policy, which I assume in that policy, parents are notified. I cannot say for sure what that is without having it in front of me. So, so again, we're not 100% sure it's covered in there, but bullying is addition to that somewhere else. So, but then my third or fourth grader could be having another third or fourth grader doing something inappropriate to them, nothing to do with the parents. And I'm not being told because that third or fourth grade says, no, don't tell mommy and daddy I'm going to get in trouble. That is a problem in my world. But I realize that we have some guidelines and statutes we have to try to jump through. Now, that being said, it is the determination of the AAO officer, as well as other people who are trained in this, to make a determination, okay, regardless of what the child or minor says, I need to address the parents for a safety concern or, you know, however the exact termination is. Um, it's their final call. That's what they're trained to do. So, and I think any of these times that my child, as long as mom and dad's directly involved in the harassment, the safety of the child is there. But right now we're talking about one person so this is my second thing I'd like to potentially look to add to this. My first one was a statement that ensures that at least the AAO officer request asked the minor, can I talk to your parents about this? The second one is when there is a decision being made that the issue at hand, regardless of however the harassment, which harassment it is, 
is decided that they can't communicate with the parents because they don't feel it you know comes to the level of a safety issue and the parent and the kids say no that i'm not sure that that should be left in the hands of just one person we have other people in the district who are trained we only have one aa officer in the district but we do have other people who have similar training as well as an option for other districts around us to be able to use communication with back and forth so that if we decide to take the rights away from a parent in this type of situation that at least two people have to discuss it now i don't expect that to be done with people who aren't you know don't go through the training don't have the all of the um requirements like I don't expect the AA officer to go have to talk, you know, okay, I can't talk to the parents, I'm gonna to talk to the superintendent to make the determination. That's not what I'm talking about. Find, you know, whether I have a second AA officer from another district sign off on that decision to treat a child without communicating with the parents or using another person within district who has similar um, licenses, but just not the AA officer. So something along those lines that would enforce that when we take those rights away from a parent to know what's going on with their child, more than just one person is making that decision. Okay. So those are my two requests at this point. And my understanding is that um, my memory serves me. Those are the you had outlined that in the email you had sent. Yes. Just I, it was a couple of things that I've kind of rethought and tossed away. Okay. Here are those two main points. Okay. Those are two. Actually, one is new, not in the email I sent. And uh, one is yes, part of the email. Okay. Anyone with further discussion on those points? I think. Yep. Sorry. I, I think the <laughs> only thing. Hold on. I don't know who was first there. But oh, no, 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 go ahead. I didn't even see you. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. All right, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, you know, I, I have pulled the actual law that is referenced here um, just because I think it's important that we understand the legal implications of all of this as well and I'm not an expert on that at all so I'm sure that the title nine officer probably can speak more to that um I wish she was here but um so 20-a chapter 201 is about privileged communications and it states a school counselor or school social worker may not be required except as provided by this section to divulge or release information gathered during a counseling relation with a client or with the parent guardian or a person having legal custody of a minor client um, and the only the exceptions that they list are the client's condition requires others to assume responsibility for the client so they're not cognitively capable of making decisions on their own or there is clear and imminent danger to the client or others. And so um, this specific one, as you can look at the back, is just kind of steeped in legal references. And I, I just have a lot of hesitations to amend something with all of these legal references without having expertise on such legal ramifications. I think that's how I feel. Anthony. Um, so a couple of thoughts. One, um, the, the, the proposal to have a second person help make the determination, um, multiple people might be an interesting way uh, to approach it, but, but I think if you have two, you have the potential for a deadlock, um, which I think you, we would want to always have an on cover because that way it's it's at least going to be you're you're going to have two to one or or unanimous right um, so that that's just one thought the other is is would it be um, satisfactory or 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 worth considering you know we've got the sentence on page six uh, of the the follow up policy. Um, which says coordinator will meet if, if the alleged victim is, uh, you know, uh, and their parent legal guardian is what appropriate, right? Would it be worth it? Would it be? Um, 
would answer your concerns if if a sentence similar to that were ported over into the section on simple harassment rather than just in the sexual harassment procedure. I'm not sure if that was a question to you, Peter. Yeah, no, I, I found it, but uh, that wouldn't hurt my feelings, but I don't think it would answer any of the, my two statements that I was looking for. Um, it, it answers my little my question earlier that it doesn't address the it doesn't address the initial event. You know, this event, this this sentence in this location addresses what's dealt with, how we deal with move forward. It doesn't deal with the initial event. So it would, um, it might address that issue or or move it on. Uh, if, if I can, I'm, I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, if there has to be a report, this seems to say that when there is a report, if the student, if there's a student involved and they're the victim, then this procedure must take place. So I'm not sure we can notify about anybody if we don't know yeah. that there's an event that's being reported. So I think that that would. <laughs> If we simply find the appropriate section, I I, I wonder if that really that, might that would be fine. And again, I think it, it's covered to a point. My concern, my two requests that wouldn't address that. Okay, but I have no problem with that. But this wouldn't address. So I think um, the, the requests have potential um, reaching implications into law. Um, I think they have. The second one, I can definitely see where they would have with potential. Two. I'm not saying it does, but I think I think there's potential for it. Um, I also, um, you know, think it would be important to consult with our current staff that deals with these issues, you know, before making some kind of large change like that. Um, and I, I think, like my, I'm a little torn between exactly how we do that, whether we um, um try to have some consultation and feedback between now and the next meeting um it almost feels substantive enough that we may want to um have the subcommittee themselves consider that um at a, at a future subcommittee meeting before um bring bring it back to us i don't know how does the subcommittee feel about that do you feel it's worth pulling that back to have those consultations or, or review the legal implications or do you feel that a uh, consultation here in our meeting would be I mean, adequate. Would the consultation have to take place at a subcommittee meeting? Would it be um, would it be possible to reach out via like email or phone to the title line officer mm -hmm. and get thoughts on that and then bring it back to the board? Yeah, I mean, I can see, um, I can see back and forth occurring, and I think that that could be a lot of back and forth into details in our primary meeting that I think is personally almost better suited for our subcommittee's work. But I, I um, yeah, anyway, I don't know. Just, just so I'm just curious before we ask that of our subcommittee if it would be worthwhile to see if that's what the overall board sure. request uh, might be. I heard so. So, um, so yeah, I don't know how we go about that. Can someone I, would have to, but I can think, I, go ahead. Can I make a motion to vote on the policy as it is recommended by the subcommittee? Yeah, so right now the motion on the floor that we're discussing is to acknowledge the first reading of this yeah. policy. And so I think to move forward, what we need is really a motion to um, consider. Yeah. Or, right now you can vote. And we'd be done. We'd acknowledging it if we voted on the, the motion on the floor. But I think what we really need is is someone to make a motion to um, review and, and incorporate the okay. request that Peter is suggesting right now. Okay. Um, so if that, yeah. You know, I, I I wonder if yeah, I, I would find it very helpful if I could if I could dive back into this a little bit. Um, uh, and I wonder if a short recess would allow some time to do that. Um, people could take care of other things during that time. Um, and, and then uh, 
because I, I almost wonder if it would be easy enough to just slide something in. That, anyway, so that it's just a thought. I, uh, my sense is a recess even to potentially solve it might not solve it. I think there are some things that, that we that we need. I think there's some consultations need to be had um, if we're going to move forward with these uh, recommendations. So I think what Jessica is suggesting that we um, take an action to to actually um, consider what Peter is suggesting that we should be directing those things to be formally considered by either the subcommittee or by us as a board or administration between this first and second reading. So I would make that motion. Or... Okay. So Peter is is making the motion to investigate those two points and incorporate them. Is there a second to that motion? Anthony is second. So any any further discussion around that motion um, before before voting on that? There was no specific wording made, so I'm just going to to amend the motion. Well, well, no. I, what I may ask you, I'm sorry. Yes. What I meant is what I heard from Peter is that he did not have specific wording, but he had some Concepts. pieces that he wanted yep. to be considered. Yes. So I am not going to write that there's specific wording. I'm going to. I agree. Like, I, I think okay. it's it's I think it's relatively specific feedback of desires of incorporated, you know, language or intent. I, I think, um, but yes, there wasn't a specific language change, but I think, um, so is that if everyone clear on the motion that's been made and it's been seconded and we're discussing it now, is there so any more discussion? Yes. It's to incorporate parental notifications so, and um, guarantee that there's more than one person making any decisions. What I have, and Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the AAO officer, um, you would like to see the AAO officer um, talk to the student and inquire about talking to their parents. Yes. And the second point would be to have uh, essentially a second staff member, a likely second AAO officer that would be consulted upon uh, whenever a notification is not made to the parents um, to, 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 to ensure that if that notification when is the not made, taken out of the there, picture. Are, there are multiple yes. people that have signed off on not notifying parents. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Or is there any clarity? Yes. Can I have a Go ahead, yes. Um, so the question, the can I communicate with parents? I actually think that's a looser standard than how people operate now given the seriousness of what sexual harassment really looks like when you look at the definitions in my world and i would be curious if evan evan agrees there would be a very small slice of students that you might not notify parents given what we're talking about would have happened to those kids in I, some I, cases I they would understand be, that right and so, but the simple fact is the rules don't permit it like yeah. Yeah. So, so what I'm suggesting is that that language actually makes it easier to not notify parents if a kid says, no, don't tell my parents. I'm saying most of the vast 99% of the time, we're going to call parents and we're not going to ask the kid if it's okay. So I think it's the opposite of what you're asking to do. That's, that's my only opinion on it. I think it's making it easier to not tell parents by letting the kid actually say yes or no. I, I want to be clear also as, as what this is, is happening right now, and that is that we are not incorporating these things. We are just directing uh, our staff to investigate this a little further, um, or taking an action to the board thinks either staff should be, should be considering it, or perhaps even, and we'll get to it in a second, whether this should go back to the subcommittee for, for their consideration. Um, so, um, but this is not necessarily something we are, this is feedback on the first reading and we will get a second reading uh, back in front of us again. So, um, any further discussion around it? Peter's um, suggested um, investigations here, recommendations. Okay. All those in favor of the, the two items to be further considered. 
Okay. That's one, two, three, four, five. All those opposed? Five to three um, abstentions? Sam. Okay. One abstention. Okay. So um, with that to be considered, how do we consider it? Should should we should it be back in the subcommittee's hands, or should uh, we keep considering this in our meetings? I I feel that um, uh, I do feel it's the subcommittee's work to draft these things and incorporate this language and send it back to us. So that's my suggestion: is that it would be considered by the subcommittee um, yeah, moving forward. But I'm open to other people's thoughts on that. If they have I echo what Anthony said before, and I would like more time to be able to consider what Peter's saying tonight, really wrap my head around it, take into consideration what Carrie's mentioned, look back at some of the laws. So I would like to see it come back to committee. Okay. Go ahead, Jessica. My only concern is that it went to committee and it came back unanimous, and now there was a concern. So if that should happen again, I'm not sure it solves. Well, the potential problem? My, my uh, and again, I you, you might notice today I changed approval of first reading to acknowledgement of first reading I kind of dove into why we're doing multiple readings in the first place and I think that a lot of but where I landed today was that that um, first readings are that it's a first uh, reading of the board and it's the point is for the for the people that drafted that proposed change to hear feedback from the full board and I think that's what we're providing today in a definitive way with the vote we just took and I think that this has the potential to change language in a way that um, would may need to be well thought out before it comes back for second reading for us to act on it. Um, um, go ahead. And, yeah. and just to also kind of make a statement to what you're saying is that it may not change. Right. But it just gives us a chance to like dive back into some things. It's been a while since we've looked at this, right? And so it gives us a chance to take all these comments. And it may not end up changing anything, but it could change. But I'd like to like not rush one way or the other and just have a chance to take five or ten more minutes and really to go over it. Oh, do we have a motion for this to be considered by the subcommittee by Bree, seconded Sorry. by Peter? Any more discussion around that? No, I go ahead. I, I just happen to have um, BGR in front of me, which is the policy making. And yes. And it does say um, right in it um, that if further consideration of the policy comes up, it can be referred back to the policy committee for further research. So it seems like, you know, we're, the policy committee's following our own policy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And, and, and you, like, like we said, it, it may just be a few minutes. We may be straightforward feedback. Yeah. You know, yeah. Anyway. And we'll reach out to the, um, to the, People that Peter mentioned. Right. All right. So let's um, let's take a vote on that motion uh, to send these directors back to the subcommittee for further consideration. It's been moved and seconded. Actually, voted on. No. Yeah, no. Oh yeah, we voted on the on the direction, but not how yeah. to handle it. So it's it's going to go back to subcommittee uh, if uh, we all vote on it. Uh, so all those in favor, sending it back to subcommittee. <laughs> Okay, that sure. is it. You know, Sorry, Jane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. We're here. Hi, Joe. Yes. So I want to take a second. Apologize to Carrie because sometimes my motions get ahead of me. I did cut you off there, unfortunately, earlier. I do apologize. For that. No problem. All right. I assure you. <laughs> Go ahead, Tracy. We have a motion on the table for the first an acknowledgement of this policy with the new wording. And we haven't voted on it. Ah, so. You want me to. No, that's a good. That's a very good so point. It's not with a new word. No, word it's not. It's just the acknowledgement. Right. So just, that's the it's, second time we'll yes. do the second reading. So here we are. Let's acknowledge that we've concluded our first reading. All those in favor? Yes. Well, it's Thank you for that good point. That's the next one. Um, so that concludes our public uh, portion of the meeting tonight. We have several executive sessions ahead of us. So I will now. Uh, to request an executive session to discuss Tricon Education Association support staff negotiations pursuant to one MRSA 405-6D. That motion, Kyle, seconded by Anthony. All those in favor? Okay. 